welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with it's the interview series presented by WFPK at WFPK.org consequence and the consequence podcast network. Thanks as always for making your way here, checking out the series. Of course, you know what to do. If you, uh, if you like what you see, what you hear, hit that subscribe button. I put out three new interviews every single week. So it's a great way to keep up with your favorite artists. And I am so excited, honored to have him back on. Art Alex Sakis of Everclear. They got a new live album called Live at the Whiskey A Go Go. Hello, sir. Hey, Kyle. How you doing? I'm well. It's great to see you back on here. And it's good um, to be back. Yeah, and so much fun. Uh, I, I should just throw the compliments at you uh, at the beginning here because uh, the new live album, uh, you know, sometimes a live album is just sort of like a stopgap and it's like, oh, that's fun. And you go back. But I think I've listened to this live album already a dozen times and just love the absolute set that happened. Um, so first off, uh, it, it sounds great. Congrats on this one. Thank you, man. It was fun to do. You know, we did it at the Whiskey A Go Go, which in my 40 years of playing in bands, um i'd never played it i've never you know i've never i've never played actually 45 years of playing in bands i've never played the whiskey and um and i grew up in la which is bizarre been how, there yeah how did that happen i don't know you know i've been there a hundreds of times been backstage did good things backstage did bad things backstage had a great time but never played there until you know, we got the offer at the end of the 30th anniversary tour last year, and it just seemed fitting to do it there. And, and you know, as the u universe would have it, um, I got reached out to by an old friend from Capitol who was at a new label called uh, Sunset Boulevard Recordings uh, Records and uh, asked me if I wanted to do an album, an, an original album. I said, absolutely not. I'm done. I've done 11 albums with Everclear. I did two with the band before it. And, one with them for that done uh, you know it doesn't mean i don't i'm not writing or or recording we're going to put out a new song or two every year maybe a maybe an ep maybe a live song maybe a cover and a couple of new songs that sounds like fun to me making a whole album doesn't sound like fun and he's like what about a live album from the whiskey because they're set up to record there and i'm like oh you know my my best scooby-doo <laughs> and um, I said, okay, I'm going to record it. I'm going to pay to record it. I'll have my producer, friend, engineer, uh, guy, Jim Kaufman, come in. And uh, and uh, I think between the two of us, it came out great. Mm -hmm. It's raw. It's a little sloppy. It's not pro-tooled and uh, auto-tuned beyond recognition. It's hardly at all. And I left notes. There's, there's some not perfect notes in there. It sounds like a rock band. What you hear is what you get. It's interesting that you're saying that, um, that uh, you know, it, the album. Uh, it's interesting because when I was listening to this and I started thinking of it in the context of this interview, and of course, it's the 30th anniversary tour that was documented last year in December. Right. And, um, and, you know, in this show, you play Fire Maple Song, which, of course, at that time, you were celebrating 30th anniversary of World of Noise. And, and I was thinking like, you know, that to me, uh, lyric wise, that sort of is point A, the starting point of this lyrical universe that you built. That's where we get the line, now I can't smile. That's where you introduce summer, you, you know, within it. Oh, wow, man, you're going deep, you know. Um, do I talk about summer? Yeah, I do talk about summertime. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, yeah, that's. Um, Oh, go on. And, and, and the fall, you know, uh -huh. and, uh, you know, yeah, no. Well, that's and, when I'm thinking about that, you know, and, and because that was one of the things, has been one of the things that's always so much fun of being an Everclear fan. You know, further on, you get local God and everything to everyone. We got the stupid dance line that kind of connects those. And you've always sort of done that. Was that intentional? Did you know that you were doing that? I mean, obviously, you knew that you were recalling other lyrics at the point, but but did you do it in a way that was to build this sort of longer narrative? A, a universal narrative, narrative, yeah, that lives within itself. Some of my favorite writers, and you, you can go Kerouac, you can go, um, you know, Robert Heinlein, um, uh, or go back as far as... Um, my favorite poet, um, Walt Whitman, 
you know, when you read Leaves of Grass, he makes connections to the body electric three or four times. He comes in there, I sing a song of myself, and then later it's I sing a song of myself in in this place and in the city streets and out there. And it connects it. It has that thought that's it's it's like the glue that connects it, you know? And um yeah, I'm not afraid to do that. I'm I'm I, I think I have license to steal for myself. I can plagiarize myself. If it, if it's within context, I think writers do that, yeah. you know. And it's fun with words, man. I just I'm having fun. Well, that's it. You know, further on, then I mean, is that how you thought? Did you ever think of it like as that big? Like, are these the same characters that's always represented in each of the songs beyond maybe the narrator? I don't know if they're the same characters, but there's we're all the same characters. The you know it it, it we we. We're unique and we're different in a lot of ways, but there's so many similarities. I mean, when you think about the literally tens of thousands of people who've come up to me, and I'm not exaggerating, that have said, Father of mine, you wrote that about my life. I'm like, no, I didn't, but I did, you know? It was a universal theme. I remember when I played that song for the first time, I'd written it at home in Portland. I was in LA to do some business, I stopped by my uh, A&R guy's office at Capitol, you know, the round building. And the offices of the executives are on the outside. And then the assistants or, you know, secretaries or whatever you want to call them, had their desk outside the office door. And I walk in and I'm like, he's like, so what can you tell me about the record? And he knows he's treading on eggs a little bit, he's, you know, because he knows I'm adamant. I don't do demos. I give you a record, you put it out. That's how it's going to work. And this is before I had a hit, right? And I was still like that on Afterglow. And he's like, well, do you got anything you can tell me? I go, I got this new song, man. I really think it's great. I don't know if it's going to fit on the record. Um, I don't know if it's a single. It's pretty dark. You know, it's a heavy song. He, he goes, and I, I go, oh, you got the guitar back. He goes, yeah, it's tuned up. I go, hey, you want to hear it? And he's like, sure. He's he's so excited because I never play him anything. He's like, sure, why not? You know, he's Brit. He's very stoic. He's stoic Brit. Perry Waltz Russell. And the door is open. And I, st I play the song. And I'm singing full, full throated, just singing it. And I get to the end. And he's, you know, like I said, he's like a 45, 50 year old stoic. British guy and he's you know he's doing this nonsense you know behind his glasses but then we hear out where the his assistant is sitting we hear this weird sound and we walk out and there's four young women sitting on a desk hugging each other weeping like weeping this is the best, best song ever and Perry Bear's just like well, it's definitely going on the record. <laughs> <laughs> and then when we finished it and recorded it and mixed it, he's just like, this, he goes, do you think this is a single? I think, I think this is a hard sell as a single. I think it's either going to fail miserably, or I think it's going to be bigger and more important than we can think if this hits people. And, it's crossed ethnic lines. I've had people from every walk of life, yeah. uh, white, black, brown, you know, everything, um, every kind of gender um, persuasion. Anybody that's had abandonment issues um, or distance issues with their father, and not just their father, sometimes their mother, um, has connected with the song. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I feel blessed to have been able to have it come through me yeah and it's i mean it's it's an undeniable classic and to well, me think, of course i can say that about so many of your songs too i mean whether you know it, it it's any of those and and songs like strawberry and and even you know like the great thing is again when you have a live album like this you know that you know it's looking at 30 years and most of it's in that first 10 years i think i think all the tracks come from maybe that first 10 years of the band uh, for the most part, but but it is it's it's a great moment to kind of 
reconnect with those. Like you have Matt Penfield. I just got done working two different weeks with Matt's out of here in Louisville. And uh, as we do every summer with the Danny Wimmer festivals out here, right. but, uh, he introduces you guys. And I'm like, oh, right. Because everything to everyone, if I remember right, debuted on 120 minutes. I stayed up like I did every Sunday, but right. I especially stayed up with the VHS and the VCR because I knew that you guys were going to yeah. debut on that one. You know, it's like, remember doing that with the radio, having it re ready to record? Absolutely. I've done plenty of times. Yeah. Way back we're, then. Uh, coming up next, Everclear, you're like, I can't do this right now, you know, or or whatever it is. When I was a kid, it was Cheap Trick or, you know, Zeppelin or something like that. Yeah. But, um, yeah, that's exciting, man. Now it's kind of too easy, right? It's just Siri, play, blah, 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 blah. It's and way too easy. I, I try to great. tell myself, yeah, I try to tell myself, like, I have I have a son, he's 16, and I try to tell myself, is like, he's just experiencing it differently, like, it, those moments still hit and while he doesn't have to try as hard the uh, uh day before yesterday we're in the car and um the Bengals version of hazy shade of winter comes on and it gets about 45 seconds a minute into it and he looks at me from the passenger seat and he goes who is this and i said it's a Bengals covering simon and garfunkel and he goes okay and later that night i hear that song playing from the shower and then yesterday He's walking ahead of me with his earbuds in and he's singing along to it again. Wow. I'm like, those moments are still there. He's just able to punch it up immediately. He doesn't have to work for it, but that doesn't mean it doesn't. I try to tell myself, like, you can still be magic. He doesn't appreciate it and, and that it's not connecting. I get what you're saying. Same thing with my daughter. I mean, you know, I've got a, a she's going to be 16 in like three weeks. Mm -hmm. um, so very close. Is your, is your son a sophomore? Yeah, yeah, he's a sophomore. Yeah, her too. So yeah, very similar. And uh, except for the fact that yours isn't walking around with push-up tops and stuff, but I don't want to get into that. <laughs> well, you got it better with a boy. Do you have a girl too or just I don't. I, I only have my boy. And yeah, One and I'm, done. I'm a little Smart bit grateful man. of that, yeah. You know, I love my daughters. I love being the father of a daughter, but, you know, there's challenges on both sides of it. So right now we're kind of... She's killing it in school, so we can't really argue. She, it's just like, mm -hmm. really, you're gonna wear that to school, really? Now she's in the so, she's in the uh, the the video for uh, she's in uh, for sing away, right? Sing away, which we're gonna talk about. I assume. Yeah. Um, yeah, she's in the video as the girlfriend, and I think she, without being father's bias, which is kind of impossible, I think she killed it. I think wow. she was great. Everybody there was blown away by her her, her chops, mm -hmm. and. Uh, she really likes musicals, which mm -hmm. I don't like musicals, but she does. So I'm supportive musical dad. Isn't that cool to see, though? I mean, my son, he he goes to performing arts school. He's interested in theater, and that's what he's been doing for a long, long time. Yeah. I, and and, and sim you, you must have had a similar experience because when, you know, he's all, he did the plays in elementary and middle. But when I saw him really come into his own on the first thing in this high school thing and walk away. It's like, who in the hell is that? And how is he able to do that? You know, I feel the same way when I see her act, when she just acts like drama plays, it's, it's, she's got something. She really does. As I'm sure your son does, because she, she goes, he goes to a performing arts school. She goes to a performing arts school. It's California school of the arts. Mm -hmm. And, but it's not just performing arts. It's, it's got all the, all the different conservatories and stuff. And she's in integrated arts, which is because her her heart's in like mostly like painting, but she also likes acting. And so her conservatory is the hardest to get into because it has everything and it's got its own micro microsystem. So it's not pulling when they do plays in her conservatory. Um, like she's up for one of the leads and remember that movie Bat uh, Mean Girls? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. There's, yeah, there's you a got the musical version of that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. there's the musical version and she's trying to get Karen, you know, the, the dumb blonde. Uh -huh. which my my daughter is neither, but she just said it's just she likes her songs and it's fun. And so, that's acting. So that's <laughs> and there's definitely acting. The, her monologue, she killed it on her monologue. Um but uh you know, it's it's just great to see um, growing up the way I did, 
and see my children have um, the opportunities they have and me going out of the way to try to make it easier for them, which is not necessarily the best thing because adversity is what creates that fire in your belly, right? Mm -hmm. I feel like my damage and adversity and all the triggers I got from that were kind of like my motive power of like, F you world, here I come, you know? Right. It, it's And I, I'm learning not to rely on those triggers because they're scary to people. <laughs> okay, so just a quick pause in our interview here because at this point in our talk, uh, we had a, a bad connection problem and we had to uh, end it and reschedule it for the next day. So uh, when everybody is in a different location and wearing different clothes, uh, that's why. Uh, let's continue. Your music, you did this, you had this really great talent in a John Hughes sort of way of speaking for youth. Sometimes from the point of view, like in a song, as I hear it, like a father of mine or something like that, it's sometimes like in Sing Away, where like the fact that you're still able to do that, you've been able to do that for 30 years, you know, where does that come from? How do you do that? I mean, is that, is that something you even know that you're doing? You know, I, I, thank you for making the reference because I love, I love what John Hughes did and people can poo poo it and diminish it because it was eighties and it was this and it was that, but you're right. He really did have a, a voice on the inside and an ear on the inside to what kids were going through in that situation, the Midwest, you know, going through the, 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 the classes, the class system, the whole thing. So for you to say that, I'm I'm very I'm flattered. Thank you. Um, to be honest with you, I just kind of when I write songs like "Wonderful" and "Father of Mine," I put myself in the place of being that kid again, because I am uh, I be I belong to the school of therapy that those when you, when you have some sort of traumatic experience as a child, you're kind of frozen there. It doesn't mean you don't move on, but that little kid there is unresolved. That eight-year-old is unresolved. You know, that 10-year-old, that 12-year-old, 12, 12 four-year-old is unresolved. And, um, you, you, you know, in different types of, like, DBT therapy, uh, delectic, delectical um, um, therapy, uh, CBT, um, you go back and you, you meet, you 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 basically try to be a parent to that that kid. I say that in a song too. I I got to be just like a father to you in the song called "You." I don't know if you know that song, but it's talking about my rape. It's on Black is the New Black, and um, I just put myself back in that place. But at the same time, I've got another ear as an adult, and I'm looking at it. You know, it's it's like to me. Whenever you're in a situation, you got to put yourself in the other person's uh, experience. But at the same time, um, to kind of like split yourself in your, and multitask and be able to have a thousand foot view of it at the same time. Yeah. And it's, and that, you know, for some reason, that comes, that comes pretty natural for me. Mm -hmm. And you know, to be fair, of course, you've written about many, many things. I mean, Year of the Tiger being the other new song on this, uh, like, well, yeah. you know, the live album. Um, but but it feels like that's, I don't want to say it like a crutch, but it feels like that's an easy place for you to go back to. Like when you're talking, you know, trying to champion youth, trying to work through the problems, someone when they're young, like, like that seems like that's that's maybe a well that you can go to when you need to, uh, songwriting wise. I, yeah, definitely. I, I I think it is. I but I don't think it's just relegated to that. You know, I mm -hmm. think it's I think it's a thing that you have to be you have to be like a two way antenna to be a good writer. You know, both inside and outside, and sometimes at the same time. Um, my my favorite writers are consciously um, aware of where they're pulling you know the historical value of where they're pulling their information but at the same time they're aware of what's going on 
outside of it as well and how those two worlds will either be cohesive or clash which is interesting all in its own yeah regardless you know yeah yeah that making any sense yeah no it definitely does and and you know one thing that we were talking about in earlier in the interview in the uh in the, in, in the part one <laughs> is you know i was saying how i loved your the lyrical universe that you've created and everything and to me so many of these do work like concept albums beyond just one album like that that it, that it always tells us you know and, and while albums might not be on your radar anymore because what i would love honestly to hear from you at one day is a rock opera i always thought maybe that was going to happen <laughs> but but even like live like is there a version of a live show that you could do where it sort of does that where it tells this story you know of a central character um I, something like like do you see it like that yeah. You know, that's weird. I I had this one guy give me a script that he wrote of a musical that created different characters and for my songs and stuff. And it really wasn't, it was kind of missing. It was, it was ambitious mm -hmm. and I was flattered, but it, it kind of missed the thing to me. I have thought about that arrogantly, I think, um, about creating a a world within a world within all the, all my records, you know, and and doing something like that, like a musical or something like that. Even though I I fucking hate musicals, excuse my language, I just do. Well, that's it. Doesn't even have to be a musical. Like uh, the Kinks, um, they're 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 they they just released one compilation. They're about to do part two of it, and it's it's just a compilation. It's a greatest hits compilation, basically. But they structured it in a way where it sort of loosely tells the story of their band. Tell the story. I, yeah. That's exciting. I didn't yeah. know they did that. But yeah. I would expect no less from Ray Davies. Yep. He's he, he's such a lyrical uh, and writer, you know. He, yeah. He's so talented. I don't think um, everybody can do that, but I think you all could do that because of, you know, the story that you've told uh, with all these songs. Anyway, I, I, I do say that as a compliment. Good for that. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Let's plant that for you. <laughs> um, I, you know, we're talking about the new songs. I do want, while we're here, uh, talking about this live album at the Whiskey Go Go, it gives me an opportunity to ask about a couple of the uh, the older songs, my favorites, because uh, Local God wasn't on an album. It was on the Romeo and Juliet soundtrack. It became its own sort of hits. And it's become one of my favorite songs of all time. It's you. I'm sure you have those songs where it just starts and you feel good. And there's something about that song, whatever the genetic makeup is in that song, that just makes me feel good. And not even the boys are back in town sort of feeling of the lyrics that come along with it. It has nothing to do with that. It's just the feeling of that song. Did you write it for the movie or what's the backstory on it? I wrote it for the movie. So I had already started writing lyrics um, for a song and I didn't know what I was going to call it. And it was it was it was already making like I was using the Romeo, like I'll be your Romeo, kind of, kind of like, kind of like, uh, in, in, almost a reference, and it might have been, um, put there by like Tombstone, like I'll be your Huckleberry, right? Mm -hmm. I'll be your Romeo, yeah, and and uh, um, and and the conflicts there within like patriarchal type looking at things and 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 boys like boys do what we want and and some people can look at it as an anthem of 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 males going we do what we want but really it's kind of just like wow you're at what a bunch of assholes we are you know <laughs> i mean pretty much but then i got the offer to do the song and they sent me a, a piece of movie that they wanted me to do it like during and um it was during the lines, and I had, I had, I had studied, I, had, I had actually been in a couple of versions uh, in college of, uh, of, of Shakespeare, including, including Romeo and Juliet, and uh, so, I'm, and I'm a huge fan of the original movie of the, Bert, Bert, uh, Bertolini, what, what, you're close. I, yeah, I forget it. What's his name? I don't know. <laughs> I know the movie. I, do, I know the movie. Yeah. 
And now there's a big thing that that they for, that he forced those kids to be sexual and stuff. Right. Have you ever heard that? Right, there's, I have heard that. Yeah, there's big drama about it. Uh -huh. Those 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 kids are in their seventies and have never been the same. And I, right. I I can't believe it. But anyways, um, I uh, so it was it was about a line of like you know uh, we become local gods and the bad blood of of you know summer um uh, brings us to, to brings us to the place of of local gods or something like that and i'm like wow that's really cool and i i said yeah i do the song and i put that in there and i put those lines in there because it really worked with what i was doing anyways right mm -hmm. and it tied into the song and so and i had just heard uh i was in macy's in new york i was in new york with my family for the uh the mtv music awards that year it was 96 and um i got the offer and that day i'd been listening to just music on, on in in macy's and it was like drum and bass was really big at the time right this mm -hmm. is in the mid 90s and i'm like that'd be really cool in a rock rock sense you know mm -hmm. that kind of rhythmic with the with the loops and shit like that that'd be really cool so that's kind of where that came from. And when we turned in the song, uh, Nellie Hooper, who was the musical director, mm -hmm. thought it was atrocious. He goes, I'm embarrassed. This is embarrassing. And he's saying, you know, you know uh, he's saying, Romeo, it's so obvious. It has nothing to do with the, the movie and this and this and that. And he hated it. Whereas Baz Luhrmann was like, this is fucking phenomenal. This is my favorite song on the, on the soundtrack. <laughs> I'm like... <laughs> I'm gonna go by what he said. Yeah, that guy. Women. You know, the guy. The yeah, guy. right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's. Um, I mean, what a moment too, because you know, Sparkle and Fade, that was hidden. You got so much for the Afterglow, and that's gonna become the big record that it is. You know, and and you, it doesn't even have to be on your own album. I mean, you've got this other track that just becomes its own little thing out there in the world. Yeah. What well, yeah. was on a soundtrack on 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 uh, Capital, which was my label, mm -hmm. and. Because of the because of the success of Sparkle and Fade, and the fact that they didn't want to totally renegotiate our deal yet, they gave us an incredible deal on that soundtrack record, and it sold like eight million records. I made almost three times the money. The band made almost three times the money um, in royalties from that one record that we yeah. did from wow from one song man yeah. and you can't lawyers, count on those man. moments lawyers can be your friends sometimes <laughs> sometimes sometimes i'm pretty sure yeah i know i have that behind me somewhere back in there back in the uh, the old cd stacks uh the other track that i was qu going to quickly ask because um in the live album again uh live of the whiskey go go um you guys play nervous and weird as well comes back on world of noise and you, you i think you even commented like how much you still loved that song i love that song it's one yeah. of my favorite songs i've ever written what and do you I, still hear in that just the swagger man just the swagger in it and just the uh, you know i had been suffering from anxiety and and um uh, you know and it was related to coming off drugs and 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 detox and all that stuff and just like you were laying in bed and I, I would levitate. I, cause when, you know, when, I don't know if you've ever suffered from an anxiety attack, mm -hmm. but it feels like electricity is going through you, mm -hmm. you know, that you can't control through your whole soul and your whole body. And that's that when I wrote that line with the swagger of that, just, boom, just kind of almost like a Stooges kind of feel mud honey kind of feel to that song. I loved it. I, I still love it. I still love playing it. And I love when uh, it goes into the lead and I play the lead and it's two note lead. Of course, Davey plays it better than I do. But when he goes into that and we're just swinging, the band's just swinging on it. And it, it's in that live version. It's just, it's right on. It just, yeah. it's rock and roll, man. I just want rock and roll. It doesn't have to be like, it doesn't have to be difficult or intricate it, it most of the time it works better when it's not mm -hmm. you know it's just straight from the gut the balls and the heart you know yeah. 
and very little from the brain. I mean, and it, it just, um, yeah, I love that song. I love playing that song. And it came out so good live that I'm like, fuck it. I'm going to put that and Fire Maple song on the record. Yeah, which I'm so happy who, you did. Who knew? But they both came out well. <laughs> but we, I'm so we've got about three or four other songs on it that that I'd have to work a little bit to make them work. But I, they might show up on like a EP later next year. I'll Maybe cool. one or two songs. I want to write a new song. Maybe do a song from like a, like take a song off a, the solo record and turn it into an Everclear song, and then maybe a a cover song and then a live song, you know, and make an EP out of that. I you know like a four song EP. I think that'd be cool. Yeah, it's it's so yeah because I was I was I was like I, I went and I cross referenced the set list is what I because I realized like yeah Volvo and Amphetamine you played that night but of course weren't you didn't put them on the live record. So, yeah, and Summerland, and Summerland. And so, that's right, and Summerland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so know. they're there. Yeah, they're there, and the drums and the bass sound good. So we, I can fix them up. Yeah. So that's the plan. I mean, you said that at the very beginning of the interview that uh, you were just thinking of like one-off tracks from here. You you weren't interested in albums at the moments. Like, are are there? I mean, beyond what we're talking about right now, the things about this EP, I mean, are there other songs sitting around? Is is there the Everclear vaults that you open up every now and then? No, there's a few songs, but I I would, and most uh, most of them are owned by Capital, right? Mm. So my idea is like next year is going to be, not next year, but 2025 is going to be 30th anniversary of Sparkle and Fade, and it's going to be the 25th anniversary of Songs from an American Movie Volume 1. And I'd like to try to get them to do some reissues, remaster, you know, um, and put out, um, their, you know, two or three songs here, maybe some live versions that they have, because we've recorded a lot of shows that are in their vaults mm -hmm. that are that are that are in, in there somewhere. So it would be cool to be able to go and do that, whether they let me do it, I don't know, but it would be interesting, you know, but they, you know, they wouldn't, they would insist on putting it out. So I wouldn't make any money off it. So, yeah. uh, well, maybe we can manifest something just by putting it out there in this interview into the world, make something happen. I like it. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Um, hey, I believe, I honestly believe that you, sometimes you have to manifest stuff by putting it out in the universe and it comes back to you. I 100% spiritual punk rocker that I am um, and, and avid, not hippie, but uh, <laughs> I do buy into energy. I've seen it. I've I'm going to tell you, I've, uh, I helped Sammy Hagar out because of our interview that they found a lost <laughs> Ben Halen song and uh it's been a few instances of that, so you know I don't mind. I don't mind was putting it, it out there. So was it a Van Halen song or a Van Hager song? Well, it was a Van Hager song. Yeah, it was. Oh. It was one of the final ones for this new box set. Oh. He didn't even remember it existed. No, it's <laughs> Twister soundtrack. That's what it was from. Awesome. But, the yeah. movie Twister. The movie uh -huh. Twister. There was a yeah. song that didn't make the soundtrack, and uh, and I knew about it. And you know, here we go. So we're just putting okay. it out there, man. That's what we're doing. Well, I like Sammy. Sammy's Sammy's a, a man, man. He's yeah. just a man. He's fun. He's ex, you know, extremely sweet guy and a hell of a fun interview too. Happy to go wherever. No, he's dude. He's he's he he just is so seems so grateful for the life he's had and just embraced it all. And he's he's taking big bites out of everything out of life. And man, people who are Sammy fans are fucking fans. They're yeah. just. Hardcore fans. Absolutely. And if there's ever a guy who embodied the line, just happy to be here. That's him. Just happy to be here, man. Yep. <laughs> happy to be a part of it, baby. I used to say that too, man. So what do you think? So what are your thoughts about this, man? I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just happy to be a part of it, man. I'm just good. It's good mentality to have. Yeah. Art, uh, seriously, the, the live album uh, is so fun to listen to, and I really, really love hearing these uh, album tracks or these uh, studio tracks on it. It's been uh, awesome to talk to you again. Thank you so much for taking the time. I'm glad we got to do this. Oh, great to talk to you. Always great to talk to you, and thanks for um, being patient with uh, part one and part two. Just made it more interesting. That's what it did. 
Absolutely. All right, man. Take care, Kyle. And thanks to my guest. Also, thanks to you for uh, for checking out the episode in the series. Before you get out of here, hit that subscribe button. Again, uh, you get three brand new interviews every single week. New and every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at uh, right here on YouTube or, of course, anywhere in podcast land, including iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podchaser, NPR, or WFPK.org as well. A great way to keep up with your favorite artists and discover new ones as well. Then after that, actually head over to WFPK.org. That's where I do a show, Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern. It's an hour full of song premieres, music news, anniversary spins, bonus interviews, Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern at WFPK.org. Consequence has your music and film news. You can also find me on the social media spots, uh, Facebook, Instagram, mostly on Twitter. All three of them, the address is at Kyle Meredith. Do hope you like and follow along. That does it for another edition. I'm Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time.